as always, we will, of course, talk to you about anything that you want. Last night, we did something pretty unusual. It's, uh, it's something that doesn't really happen too often on Free Talk Live. We actually spent the entire show generally on one topic. The majority of the show, the, the whole show basically, was focused on the ridiculous behavior uh, of the government bureaucrats in Palmer, Massachusetts yesterday as when they were confronted with approximately a dozen liberty activists, the majority of whom had come down from Keene to support me at my pretrial conference. But the video of the insanity at the front door as multiple activists attempted to enter with video cameras, the video from one man's camera, James Cleveland, one of the newer movers uh, to Keene. Um, so if you heard what we were talking about last night on the show and you wanted to know you know, how accurate was our discussion, now you can watch about 12 or 15 minutes of footage. I think it's about 12 minutes. Of footage from yesterday. But there's more footage uh, from today. Because to, this is a busy court week uh, here in the Keene area. Apparently. Of course, I was in court yesterday in Palmer. This morning, Garrett Ian, who is one of the bloggers at freekeen.com, also freeconquered.org, uh, was on trial for a bicycle light. And before you, you know, stop and uh, aghast at that comment, that's how. A lot of the activists are up here. Look, if you want to ticket me for something piddly like a bicycle light, I'm going to take it to court. I just got a parking ticket the other day here in Keene. I'm going to court. And I've been to court before. This has been my third parking ticket trial. I've been to two. Yep. And uh, I've had one in Keene, one in Concord, and this will be my second one in Keene. Yeah, I'm not driving for Concord for one. It was great. The Concord one was my best one uh, thus far uh, with uh, the, Real con- Perry Mason, the Concord government bureaucrat uh, <laughs> admitting to... Uh, being on duty at the time that she was in the courthouse, meaning that she was unable to be walking around handing out people parking tickets. So I actually, by taking that ticket to trial, saved the people of Concord uh, to approximately, you know, I think it was 200 bucks. I'm sure they're eternally grateful. <laughs> well, I think if you don't get, I mean, they don't know, the people who were in Concord parked that day don't know that I saved them from being ticketed. Because I was in the courtroom, I wasn't out on the streets doing Robin Hooding and paying meters for people while the parking meter attendant was walking around, which is another great thing to do for folks. But it is true. I did save a bunch of people from being ticketed. Approximately 20 people were not ticketed because I had that parking meter lady in a courtroom with me. And I actually ended up, uh, of course, losing the case, but I was I offered a $50 payment, a fine payment to a local charity in lieu of actually paying $10 to the state, and the judge accepted that offer. So ultimately, yeah, I spent some time and I spent some money on gas to go up to Concord to take that trial on. But as far as activism is concerned, by all qualifications, total success. I lost the case, but I won in that I saved 20 people from getting tickets that morning and also was able to pay the fine to a local charity. Yeah, furthermore, you cost... The the uh, who wh- what is the entity that was prosecuting you? The city, city of, of Concord. Yeah, and and you cost them two hundred dollars or one hundred and ninety five in revenue. Yeah. Oh, yeah, let's not forget the cost, the cost of, of the, the trial, the, the court right. itself. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing what they'll throw after a five dollar parking ticket. Uh, it's incredible. In this the- case, they were throwing a, a court trial after a twenty nine dollar ticket for Garrett Ian this morning, as he was over a year and a half ago. Uh, so you know, so much for the speedy trial. But over a year and a half ago, he was ticketed in Concord at about 2.30 in the morning for being on his, uh, actually not even being on his bike, for walking his bicycle. He was not on the bike at the time the police officer pulled them over, so to speak, stopped on the scene. And uh, basically they ticketed him. Some state law requires that you have to have a light on your bicycle that is visible from up to 300 feet away or something like that. And he did not allegedly have a light on his uh, bicycle, so... Rather than give him a warning, this officer wrote him a ticket. But he wasn't riding the bicycle. That's correct. Apparently just being with the bicycle. And the bicycle apparently wasn't even his. It was his friend's bicycle. Does the bike have to be in motion for this to count? Or if I have a bike along the side of my house, must it have a light on it? That's a good question. I mean, this is just, it's crazy. They would have to be able to ascertain whose bike it was and in this case an interesting aspect of the case is that apparently not they only just have to find the person who's closest to it well right because it wasn't actually garrett's bike it was his friend's bike and so that's kind of contradictory to the way the system works in another case mark as you discovered when you took a parking ticket to uh to the police department here in Keene 
a few months back, maybe several months back, trying to challenge it and take it to court. They told you that the rule is that you can't challenge a parking ticket unless you're the registered owner of the vehicle. So isn't that interesting? On one hand, when it's convenient for them to mm-hmm. go only go after registered owners because they were sick and tired of anyone just challenging parking tickets here in Keene, I think that's why they implemented that rule. Absolutely, because I had taken one to trial previously for a car that was not registered in my name, right? So and which I found rules. amusing too, because you know, are you telling me I could just hang out here all day and start taking tickets, tickets to off of trial? people's, <laughs> yeah, off their cars? So you weren't able to take your ticket that you were given because you were driving your wife's car at that time it Mm -hmm. was your responsibility you would think but no no apparently it's now the responsibility of the registered owner whatever is done with that vehicle so if if i borrow your car johnny ray and i park it downtown and litter it with tickets apparently it's your responsibility whoa yeah but on the other hand if you're riding someone else's bicycle and it doesn't have a light on it that's your responsibility yeah it's it's a very strange situation because um, the next time when i my wife got a ticket in my vehicle then i certainly jumped on the opportunity to take that to trial mm-hmm. and i you know i made it very clear to them i did not drive this vehicle i did not park this vehicle and i it frankly i didn't tell the person who parked this vehicle that uh that they could take it that morning and so but you're on the hook so how in the world can you uh you know hold me responsible and then they put the law you know say that the law that uh, you know basically in the law it says that you can't uh you know allow someone to uh have the vehicle or something or uh, allow allow someone to illegally park the vehicle so now i have a sort of a, a a notarized uh witnessed piece of paper in the vehicle saying you know that that I do not allow there's there's three things like allow permit or whatever uh the vehicle to be parked illegally um so now I'm going to have a signed document the next time I get a ticket that says no no I I you know as uh, let's see defendant's evidence A here and uh, that uh, no no I didn't allow that see I have a signed notarized document that says I didn't and that would mean that I don't know <laughs> I have no idea what it means. It's a five dollar ticket. Who cares what it means? <laughs> I love the I love the never take a plea concept. Yeah, I, I've it's it's arguable, it's debatable how much good I do sitting behind this microphone. But as far as never take a plea, the state of New Hampshire has only realized a loss on all their prosecutions of me. Indeed, you were prosecuted for uh, having an open container at one time, and uh-huh. you took that one to trial. Now. Uh, Coming up still, we have a story, Mark, that you brought in last night. We didn't get a chance to get to. Uh, We will get to that tonight. The teen male strip searched in in a school, apparently. Uh, We'll get to that story here in a moment. But actually never finished what we'd initially started talking about. We went off in different court-related directions and, you know, theoretical, what do you do in this kind of situation, uh, illegal police searches, that sort of thing. Uh, And I never explained what actually went down this morning in Concord District Court in Concord, New Hampshire, as activist Garrett Ian, liberty activist and New Hampshire native, by the way. He's a really active uh, liberty guy, but he was born and raised here in New Hampshire. He's not a Free State Project uh, participant, as I understand it. Garrett was on trial today for a bicycle light violation. So he took basically an hour of the court's time. Not quite, maybe about 50 minutes uh, of the court's time today and the prosecutor's time and the park, uh, the no, not parking, but the, the cop that arrested him took some of his time, too. And, uh, and a lot of times the cops will get overtime, so they really like this stuff. That could be true. And that question was not asked of the officer as to whether or not he was getting overtime. Typically, they do get overtime for this. But the idea is to make the prosecutor and the state folks actually work to get their convictions rather than just taking a plea deal, which is what most people do. I mean, most people, when faced with a $30 fine, $29.70 something cents, when faced with a $30 fine for not having a light on their bicycle, will just apologize profusely to the judge, say they'll get it fixed, and cut a check and or get on a payment plan because most of the people in these courts claim they have absolutely no money and they have to go and you know stri- string payments out over several months which of course usually ends up in a payment plan fee uh, that is then added to the payment plan and it's even more expensive that way. But the idea is to make them work for it because normally they don't have to work. Normally all they have to do is come to you with a plea deal and, of course, you want it to go away. You don't want to go to trial. You don't want to spend any more time on it. You just want to get back to your life. You just want to get back to your business. You want to get back to your family. You want to get back to the things that are important to you. Being in court and you know taking things to trial, not important to the average person. And that's how they get you because if everybody 
just goes along to get along. If everybody just takes the plea deal, the prosecutor never has to prove a single case. They don't have to spend any time or effort actually making a case. We've actually had people call in that said that they took a, you know something to, to trial, and it was the first trial in years. In the courthouse, At yeah. these courthouses. I mean, this is how rarely these things actually yep. go, to, go to trial. I mean, it's far fewer than 1% of arrests end up in a court trial. The, all of the rest of them are either A, dropped, or B, and this is the largest uh, percentage, somehow meted out in, a, uh, in some kind of uh, you know, plea deal. Exactly. And a plea deal doesn't help anybody. A plea deal only helps, I'm sorry, it does help people. It helps two groups of people that you don't particularly want to help. A, guilty people, and B, prosecutors uh, who are just, you know, the gov- our government servants who we have put in place in order to do this work. And I guess judges to some extent, although they, you know, they're going to be sitting there anyway. Indeed. Yeah, it's just a, it's, it's like an assembly line. You go to court, the prosecutor comes out, he goes from one person to the next. They are oh, the overwhelming majority of everybody in there. And you guys said all this last night, but the overwhelming majority of people in there are accused of victimless crimes. That's right. The prosecutor goes from one to the next, and and he he they're they're worried about this I- insane fine that they might have to pay, and he says, "Don't worry about it. I'm gonna you know I'm a I'm a nice guy. This is we're fair here, and we're yeah. gonna we're gonna offer you a deal." So so everybody takes the deal, and uh, the the municipality, be it the city or the county or whatever, they they make bank. They sure do. It's Cha-ching. literally thousands of dollars every single day. Roll through these courtrooms. Oh, more than that. Well, at least thousands of dollars thousands. every single day. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, the idea is to clog up the system. Make them work for it. If 10% of the people who got parking tickets took those to trial, they wouldn't have enough room in the courts to handle all those cases, in my opinion. Now, of course, 10% ever do that. I don't know if that'll ever occur because, again... The incentives are stacked against you. Most people don't want to have to ever come back to that courthouse. Well, I don't blame them. In a lot of and, cases, once um, you know, if 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 this has ever been tried, in most places, they have uh, you know set up so that it's avoided. They'll give you court tri- uh, costs, court costs, four hundred dollars like court costs, just for wanting to take. I mean, just for wanting justice. Right. They make an accusation, and then they'll charge you for wishing to contest the accusation. That, and sometimes they'll even tell you, oh, sure, you can uh, accuse, you can uh, contest this, but what you have to do first is pay the fine in full, then we'll allow you to contest it, and if you win, we'll refund the fine to you. Yeah, and then... There they, are states that do that. They call this justice. Yeah. So here in New Hampshire... It's not perfect. The system is not perfect here. We, we, I'll tell you about what happened later on uh, tonight you know, with a conflict with some of the bailiffs and court security over a video camera. We've got issues, but at least we don't have this problem where you've got to pay a fine up, for, up front in order to challenge it. That you don't have to do here in New Hampshire. There's no additional court costs tacked on. If you take a parking ticket, like here in Keene, if you take a $5 parking ticket to court, it's $5 if you lose. You know, that's what the judgment will be against you is the five dollars. So there's that's no true. court costs tacked I've on paid to, it. to that. I've heard rumor there are court costs in Manchester, but I have yet to confirm that rumor. I've heard that from somebody out in, in Manchester that, that they do it that way there. Um, but, you know, I don't know if that's true. But for, generally in New Hampshire, you can challenge your tickets. You can challenge, you, you know, these criminal charges and not have to pay extra if you are found guilty. And most of the time you will be found guilty just because that's the way the system rolls. I mean, this, the statutes are written the way they're written. If you violate it, then they're going to get you. I've but seen at least plenty of people that beat it. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think to some extent activists are known here in New Hampshire, mm-hmm. and most of our experience is in New Hampshire, and they have no intention of letting us win anything. If these people want to win, they can win on appeal. But I've seen sort of the average individuals win at least some of the time. It does happen. And you'll never win if you take a plea deal. That you can guarantee. That's like you know calling it quits. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying you're a bad person for taking a plea deal. Everybody, you know, has a time in their life when this is right or not right for them. And t- t- from my perspective, being in New York or California or one of these other states, 
where you don't have an activism network behind you, where you've got extra rules that apply to taking things to court. It makes total sense to take a plea deal in those cases, especially if you're planning to move to New Hampshire someday as part of the Free State Project. Make your stand here. Make your stand here. Clog this system up. Having been here in New Hampshire and taking these things to court and experiencing that, I I couldn't live anywhere. I couldn't live somewhere where you were required to pay court costs in order to try and get some justice for yourself. Well, most uh, people are never confronted with it. Like I said, ninety, you know, fewer than one percent of cases end up in trial. They don't want them in trial, so the vast majority of people don't end up doing it. Yeah, that should that should that should be illegal. It's unjust. In in a justice system, it is clearly unjust. You can't find, I can't find, I'm talking to tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people right now, and not one of them will call in in the next 10 minutes to defend the idea that there's court costs for actually taking something to trial for an accusation yep. that an innocent person, uh, you know, ostensibly innocent person, presumed innocent person, would have for taking something to trial for an accusation. It's just, it's nuts. 855-450-FREE. That's the SACL CAI toll-free line. Tell us your story, your court experience. Have you ever gone through any of this stuff? 855-453. You can take control. This is Free Talk Live. We've can, we've kind of continued the legal conversation tonight. I mean, there's a lot going on out in legal land, and maybe you've had experience you want to share, or you're in the midst of something. We are certainly not attorneys, but, uh, you know, we do have <laughs> some experience. Take our advice at your own peril. <laughs> we have some experience at this uh, whole lawyer, lawyerly thing, or rather the uh, the legal land This uh, is not advice. Experience. That's correct. It's not even intended to con- be construed in any way, shape, or form as advice. Uh, But anyway, 855-450-FREE is the number. I was again in court today. This time it wasn't my trial. It was Garrett Ian's trial. And he was taking a $30 ticket, which was in regards to not having a light on the front of his bicycle. That he was walking. That he was walking at the time, yes. And Garrett's contention, and the video will be available at some point at freekeen.com. I know he's working on it as we speak. Uh, But Garrett's contention is that uh, this officer in particular targeted him because he'd had a previous interaction with said officer where the officer was very upset about the fact that Garrett was audio recording him. And so he'd had a previous interaction and he targeted him again in this particular case because of that. The officer Garrett also is refuses distinctive to, looking, so it's possible the officer could actually pick him out on the side of the road. I don't think he had his fro at the time that this uh, okay. was, was done, but he's certainly distinctive looking now. Yeah, he's got a big giant afro. And... Anyway, he uh, – so this officer did not identify himself. He's being you know, one of those typical rude cops where he's being asked what his name is. He's refusing to identify. Uh, that is, the cop is refusing to identify and you know, t- targeting somebody because they're a known activist basically was, was Garrett's contention at the trial today. But you know, as far as the actual law itself – it's probably going to be a guilty finding. I mean, he didn't have the light on the front of the uh, the bicycle. He didn't bring up the Tenth Amendment right to uh, or Tenth Article Ten right to revolution, which we have here in New Hampshire, which most states don't have in their constitution. I think it would be interesting to try that one out and see how that goes. But uh, the the story really what, that I wanted to relay wasn't so much about Garrett's trial and the details uh, therein. You can see all that in the full trial video, which will again be up at some point at freekeen.com or freeconquered.org, which is Garrett's website. But more to talk about the ridiculous behavior of the court bureaucrats. I mean, literally 24 hours after uh, James Cleveland, who's one of the newer movers here, was threatened by court security bailiffs in Palmer, Massachusetts, James Cleveland was once again threatened by court security bureaucrats in Concord, uh, New Hampshire, for the basic same thing. In this case, there was one difference. The bureaucrats allowed the cameras through this security checkpoint. In Massachusetts, we couldn't even get past the security checkpoint with any kind of electronic device. So the cameras were allowed through the checkpoint, but the bailiffs were making the call that you can't be using those cameras. So it's been the case for... You can have the camera, you just can't use it. Right. It's been the case for a while here that camera use or any audio recording device usage in court lobbies is completely prohibited. And there's supposed to be some kind of a staging area in which one could use a camera, but I don't yet know where these staging areas are or if they've ever they're been not going to share it with you discerned uh but anyway th- so we all were allowed through i had a camera in my bag pete air from copblock.org had a camera uh daryl perry from fpp.cc had a camera and garrett 
or excuse me, uh, James also had a camera, and Garrett had a camera. Every activist that came out to uh, to this today was armed with a video camera. So we all made it through, and immediately I, myself and Daryl proceeded to the window of the clerk's office to file notices to record, as we always do, to be able to get the cameras in the courtroom and record the trial. Um, but I, you know, I'm on, like, I've got five different cases working right now, and I'm out on a suspended sentence, so I was not able to push things as far as James did today. James does not have any suspended sentence hanging over his head, so he was much more able to be brazen with uh, his recording. And he had his camera out. Mine was just in my bag. Uh, I was waiting until I got into the courtroom. So he's got his out. It's sitting on the, the counter, and at one point, the off, one of the uh, court security officers comes in to start reading us the rules. Now, he's not reading them from a sheet of paper or anything like that. He's just telling, he wants to let us know what the rules are. He wants to assert his authority. And he lets us know that uh, the rule is that you have to give 24 hours notice in advance of a trial in order to, to uh, be able to record it. And I immediately said to him, and this uh, was caught on the recording, by the way, which I'll post over at the, uh, the Facebook and the Twitter. You are you. wrong, Mamma Jamma. I said, yeah, that's, not, that's a lie, basically, is what I told him. And that's because I was in that very same courthouse a week prior and had been there multiple times prior to that where I had not filed 24 hours in advance. I had filed 10 minutes in advance and uh, was no problem able to get up into the courtroom and record the trials. 855 450 free. They almost arrested James for what he did next. It's Free Talk Live. Brought up a point I wanted to make that applies to everything. If you're ever facing even a parking ticket or, you know, a speeding ticket, something that just seems routine, seems run-of-the-mill, take the time to file for a motion, uh, file a notice or request or motion for discovery, depending on whatever the court rules require there. Usually it's just a simple matter of sending a piece of paper into the, uh, the prosecutor and the court and saying, I would like discovery, please send it to this address. And then before the trial happens, they have to send you, in most places, This, you know, again, not a lawyer, not legal advice, but in my experience, in most places, they have to send you all the evidence they have against you. So police reports, you know, whatever uh, evidence they've collected, uh, whatever they've found online, whatever, anything they've got that they plan on using in the trial against you, they have to send it to you. That way you're not walking into the trial blind. And so we'll, uh, what I wanted to relay to you was the continuing difficulty uh, that activists are having here in New Hampshire. And I imagine this would apply anywhere because it certainly applied in Massachusetts court yesterday when they wouldn't even let cameras in through the front door. In New Hampshire, we were able to get the cameras through the front door, but if you actually appeared to be using a recording device in any portion of the courthouse... They will swarm you like a pack of wild animals, and they will do whatever it takes to intimidate you into stopping and possibly arrest you as well if you do not stop. And that's exactly what happened today. The video footage uh, I will post, I've said I would post it, and I will at some point here, over on our uh, Twitter and Facebook so you can see it for yourself. Uh, So let me give you more detail on what actually transpired. We get into the courthouse. We're in the court lobby. I filed my notice to record. My camera's in my bag. I don't have the ability to really challenge this stuff at the moment. I've got five open cases. Uh, James, however, James Cleveland, a newer mover to, uh, to New Hampshire from Georgia, he has his camera in his hands, and he's also filing a notice to record. And he notices the head court bureaucrat who I've never had an interaction with that I can recall, and I've been to this courthouse several times in in Concord. Uh, The head court bureaucrat comes up and begins to, uh, the security bureaucrat, begins to inform us that there is a 24-hour window that's required in order to file a notice to record a trial, and I immediately tell him that that is just not true. Uh Yeah. And so let me give you some of the audio of what actually happened this morning. Okay, we are going to set this up. Is it required to give 24 hours? That's not true. Well, I'm just telling you what I'm going to say. Whether you think it's true or not. Is well, I know it's not true. I've been in this We're not in our discussion. Before. It's going before the judge. If the judge makes the decision no, it's not. If the judge makes the decision yes, only one person goes in. It's, it's, a, it's a notice. 
Only it's, one uh, I'm not acting fine. with you. I'm telling you what our policy is. I understand you're telling me what you think your policy is. I'm telling you what our policy is. But the, the board policy it's a notice, and so you don't need to put your hand in my then, face. Then let me it's, finish talking. He's being very rude. He put his hand right, I mean, not right up in my face, but pretty darn close to it to get me to stop uh, talking to him. And, you know, these guys love right. to. And this isn't, this isn't uh, some, uh, you know, mom and pop business where they can change their policy on the fly. This is a courthouse and their policies are published. Supposedly. Supposedly. At one point, he points me to a, uh, you know, an order that had been printed out and posted on the wall of the courthouse. I went and looked at that order and determined, because... I know a thing or two about this here court system, having basically it been my hobby for the last, one of my hobbies for the last several years. This order in particular has actually been superseded by a newer order that I am well aware of because it had directly to do with recording in court lobbies, and it's an issue I'm very much concerned with. So I was well aware that this order was outdated, and I pointed that out to him. But nonetheless, it didn't matter, of course. They're going to do whatever they want to. And I was in this very same courthouse a week prior recording Daryl's uh, a different hearing for a different person. They, multiple times in this courthouse, have allowed one, more than one camera into the courtroom. Now, the judge has total discretion on this matter. If the judge decides that the judge would only like one camera in the court, courtroom that's it end of story there's only one camera allowed in the courtroom if the judge is okay with there being two three four cameras in the courtroom that's okay too but it's not policy right this the policy is the judge can say whatever they want and he didn't say that the judge has said no the ju- he said the policy is there will only be one camera allowed in the courtroom and that's just a flat out lie and he also said the policy's 24 hours notice to record in the courtroom also a lie there was a time at which Last year, when they were cracking down real hard on on court security because of camera because of activists toting cameras in their lobbies, when they were cracking down real hard, they tried to require a twenty four or forty eight hour notice. I forget which one it was, but a couple days notice. I heard it was forty eight, but okay. yeah, it was forty eight. Whatever. But, um, um, speaking to the to the way the two of you were were relating to each other and treating each other in normal human interaction. If you if he said something that wasn't true and you said, hey, that's not that's not that's not true. The normal thing would be to let, sit and wait to hear what you had to say and then respond to it. But when you are a the the duly constituted violent guy in the room, um, governments as they're constituted are, are are violent things. When that is the paradigm, the it's important that you don't. That you that you shut these people that you shut people like you off mm-hmm. and you maintain control, control at all times. Yep. And of course, I'm not someone who likes to be controlled, and I have experience at these things. So you know, had I been some schmo who just come into the the courthouse for the first time ever with the wild haired idea to uh, to record a, a hearing, I'd have probably believed the guy because you know he's authoritarian. He's got that demeanor. He knows he appears to know what he's talking about. He seems to be in charge. And most people would have said, "Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't follow 48 hour notice. I'm sorry. I didn't know that." officer but i know better <laughs> so i'm willing to speak up for uh, for what i know about and then later on in this video they also attempt to prevent us from even going upstairs again i have my camera in my bag at this point i'm not recording anything uh and i had you know just started walking up the stairs as i'm walking up the, i'm not going to play this part of the video because the audio wasn't very good during it but uh as i'm walking up the stairs daryl's following behind me pete's behind me from copblock.org Pete and I get up the stairs first. Daryl's still kind of halfway up the stairs at the time. The one of the court officers bellows to him that you can't go up the stairs with cameras. Well, I was up the stairs with a camera a week ago, and prior to that, multiple times. So I asked them. I asked them later. Uh, you know, did you change your rules about this? And he claims that they didn't change their rules. But there are no rules. These rules aren't written down anywhere. It, uh, James, uh, who was recording the video, asked to be shown the rules. He was not shown them because they don't exist. It's just bureaucrats making stuff up on the spot. It's absolutely ridiculous. So James is recording a lot of this audio, like a lot of the stuff that's going on, and they're kind of they kind of focused. They're not really focused on him recording. They tell him that he's not allowed to record, but then they focus more on me and Pete and and Daryl. Like, there's enough activists there to really kind of throw him for a loop. They're not sure where to focus their energies. And eventually they finally focus back on James because he's the guy obviously recording things. They finally focus on him. They tell him that he needs to turn it off or he needs to leave the, the building. And he hasn't turned it off. He's kind of like 
moving over slowly towards the door, backing towards the door, and they come at him like, you know, as I said before, like a pack of wolves. Like, they're surrounding him. They're closing in on him. And I'm watching this, and I know how this goes. You know, they get you up against that wall, and then it's it's curtains. I mean, you're you're under arrest. They grab the handcuffs, and you're going down to the, you know, the catacombs uh, at that point. Had he stayed where he was for five more seconds, I have no doubt that these men would have arrest, arrested him. He managed to kind of scoot out from around one of them and and move towards the door to escape their grasp, basically. And they let him go. They didn't run after him and, and grab him or anything like that. Mark, you saw the video yep. before the, the show started tonight. They did go hassle him, though. Well, they yeah. told him that not to stand in front of the door so it didn't let the heat out. Yeah, I get that, but... Uh, but what were your impressions, Mark, of the the video as uh, as you had seen it? Well, I it seemed like you know it seemed to me that they were you know that they'd been given some kind of order, no cameras, and that they were you know doing their best to enforce it. You're right. There's no rhyme or reason for their rules, and they just make this stuff up as they go. Um, at least it has that that appearance. When last week you're in there recording, and this week you yep. can't. Oh no, no, it's always been the rule. Um, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, the, the the people want consistency, and. The policy there says that you're allowed to go to the clerk of the court's office with a camera and record um, and, and be able to take pictures of uh, pages that you get there. So obviously cameras are allowed. But, you know, at what point can you use the camera? You can't use the camera. It's just crazy. It's it's so arbitrary. Why in the world can a, a person not a, a, pub, a member of the public not film in the lobby of a public building? Coming up, your calls. But it's this way, by the way, in a lot of places. If you don't believe it's this way in your local courthouse, take a video camera down there and turn it on inside the lobby and see what happens.